Father figures and our fathers and grandfathers and those who are here and those who have passed away. Called My Old Man by Zach Brown. He was a giant. And I was just a kid, I was always trying to do everything he did. I can still remember every lesson he taught me, growing up, learning how to be like my old man. But I was defiant When he made me walk the line He knew how to lift me up And when to let me fall Looking back he always had a plan My old man My old man Feel the callous on his hand and dusty overalls My old man Now I finally understand I have a lot to learn From my old man Now I'm a giant Got a son of my own, he was always trying To go everywhere I go Do the best I can to raise him up the right way Hoping that he someday wants to be Like his old man My old man I know one day that we will meet again As he's looking down My old man I hope he's proud of who I am I'm trying to fill the boot of my old man take off your face masks if you would like to do so. And just as a reminder, we ask people from this point on to stay in your seats if possible. If you absolutely must get up, please put your face mask back on, fully covering your nose and mouth. And then um, if you're going to be walking past uh, anyone within six feet, give them the chance to do the same. Thank you very much for that. And good morning. Aloha. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu or pastor of Koloa Union Church, and I welcome everybody here to our worship service today. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and grandfathers, and maybe even some great-grandfathers among us, and also all those who are father figures in the lives of people. It's great um, for me to be able to look back over the years that I knew my dad when he was alive, and thank you, Doug, for that wonderful opening song. It's also Juneteenth, the day that we celebrate the end of institutional slavery in our country. And I'll be talking a little bit about that in my message. Okay, more than a little. I'll be talking a lot about that in my message today. And um, I hope you'll enjoy that. I want to welcome all of our guests who are here today. And if you're here for the first time, we do have a... Um, 
a packet for all of our first time visitors. There's a gift in there from the church for you. We also have um, information about the church and a visitor card so you can give us some information about yourself as well. So hopefully you got one if you're a first time visitor. If not, be sure to get one on your way out. And also, um, I did want everybody to know that at the top of page five, we have our temporary worship guidelines uh, during the pandemic. And so if you haven't been here before, or it's been a while, just make sure you're aware of what our guidelines are. And we really appreciate people following the guidelines because it's really important as a church that we uh, do all that we can to keep people healthy. Also, during the pandemic, we do not pass around this offering bowl, but if you would like to give a gift, if you've been especially blessed by our time today, you may drop off an offering um, up here at the end of the service, and we also have an offering basket right outside the main doors over here, so thank you for your generosity. We do have a church council meeting today immediately following the service, so about 10 minutes after the benediction, the Church Council will meet back in here, so there's no Ho'okipa wellness class today. We'll pick that up again next week. And as we begin our service today, I invite you just to think about all the forms of slavery that you may have either known about or experienced. Think about um, institutional slavery, also think perhaps about some of the ways we might enslave ourselves or the people around us in ways that might be inappropriate. And I'm guessing that almost everybody here, perhaps everyone can think of at least one or two ways. I know I can. So I'm just gonna leave you with that and think about what might it take for you to be free or for others to be free and more free, amen. Good morning. I'm not Cron. <laughs> I'm Grandma. He's still home getting his beauty sleep <laughs> at nine years old. Um, I just want to say that I was particularly blessed this morning. I'm so grateful that I got to speak with my dad this morning. He's 95, lives in Oregon, and so it's, that was special. So please join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship God, the giver of life. Let us give thanks to God, who gives breath to all living things. Let us honor God by recognizing the light of God within each person. Let us serve God by ending all forms of inequality and discrimination. Let us bring about the reign of God by working for a just world for all. Let us pray. O oh God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let your spirit guide us into your presence and to your dreams for the world. For you have told us what is good and what you require of us. It is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. O oh God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let your spirit guide us to you with great joy and to praise you with music and singing. And yet we know that all of our worship means little to you if we fail to share with others and treat them poorly. So let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. O oh God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Let your spirit guide us to the lives of those who hunger and thirst and to offer them comfort and peace. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 22, verses 1 to 5 and 25 to 29. Listen for the word of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear you. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, 
Those who seek God shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and God rules over the nations. To the Lord, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before God shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for the Lord. Today's New Testament reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. Listen for the word of God. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Today's gospel reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22. Listen for the word of God. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it. Yes, you invite Rose Tatiana to do a hula for you to express in, in motion the, the words. We decided to do this uh, song. It's called oh, well, Amazing Grace, and then combined with a song called You Are So Beautiful by Joe Cocker. But uh, we chose this song because... It fits into Kahu's message. Uh, if you don't already know the story about Amazing Grace, I'm going to just repeat it one more time here. Uh, written by Reverend John Newton, who prior to becoming a, a, a pastor and, and finding uh, the Lord and Jesus Christ, was actually a, a, either a captain or I think he was a captain of a slave ship where he actually brought slaves over from West, West Africa. And then later on, he found that the, a disgrace in himself in what he did, but he found that God gave him this amazing grace, even from his prior failures as a human. And they also say that a tune may come from a tune from, I think, from Europe, but also some also debate that and feel that the tune came from, uh, it, it was very close to a morning um, chant from West Africa, the, the tune is very similar to that, where they were mourning the dead. And then you can only imagine that on many of his trips from West Africa, many of these men, slaves, that were in the, the bottom of the darkest part of the ship were humming this tune as they were transported from West Africa to, to the Americas. So amazing grace and you are so beautiful. Oh, 
ไม่เคยเฮนานโนโอละไม่ยาวเ
Mahalo Nui, Rose Tatiana and Doug for that beautiful melee and hula. How appropriate for today on June, Juneteenth. Two hundred and forty-four years before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln, the first slave ship arrived in Jamestown in what is now Virginia. It was a year before the Mayflower arrived, and many people don't know how early slavery actually came to the United States. And I also know that many people are really unaware of how entrenched slavery was for the first quarter of a millennium as our country was being founded, actually way prior to that, and in the early years. Just a little over three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit Jamestown while I was on the East Coast. It was my first trip to Virginia, and there were several things that I wanted to see. Uh, in Washington, D.C., I also had the opportunity to visit uh, Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, and also George Washington's home, Mount Vernon. It was so clear visiting these places where the slaves lived on the property and what their role was in that time. I know that some of you know that for the last couple of years during my study leave time, I focused on racism in the United States, and in particular on what racism has been like and the racial discrimination toward African Americans. And I've attended some events, some lectures, but mainly I've read about a dozen books or so and listened to many podcasts and uh, news, um, read news articles and so on and so forth. And I think the main takeaway for me over the last couple of years is that racism and racial discrimination is truly entrenched in all parts of our society. It's always been in our education, in our housing policies, our banking policies, politics, voting, and the list goes on and on and on. Well, I have to tell you, after two years of focusing on racism in our country, I thought I was prepared emotionally to visit the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, but boy, was I wrong. So in Washington, D.C., if you haven't been there before, there's all these amazing museums, mostly free museums, and when I was there, one of the top things that I wanted to see in the D.C. area was that museum. And just yesterday, I was looking through some of my notes that I have written about my experience after being there, and I thought it would be helpful just to read to you what it was like going to the museum, the Smithsonian. And so I'm going to read to you just some of my notes that I've written afterwards to give you an idea of my experience, and not just what I did, but how it felt and what I thought. And by the way, I also did the same thing at Jamestown, which was the very next day. But let me just focus here for a moment on the museum. So these, as I said, are some of my reflections that I wrote down. I should probably tell you ahead of time that when you get to the museum, it's massive. It, it, it's a very unusual um, building in terms of its architecture. It looks somewhat like a slave ship, actually. I've never seen a building that looks anything like it. There are four, it's massive, there's four stories above ground and three below. And above ground, they deal with history and culture and heritage. Below ground is the history, actually. It's just all the history. So you take an elevator 
and you go to the bottom level. That's where people told us that we should start the experience. And so I was with my friend David, who lives in Washington, DC. And David was actually a kid in a youth group that I led back when I was in seminary. In fact, when I was in college, he was in a junior high Sunday school class that I taught. And I hadn't seen him in years. But David said, why don't you come to Washington, DC, and just let me know some of the things you want to do. And I just said, well, going to this museum is one thing that's just on the top of my list. And he said, great, I want to go too. So David and I, right after lunch, we were there, I think, at 11, as soon as they opened for lunch. And then we took the elevator down. And here's what I wrote. The bottom level is called Slavery and Freedom, 1400 through 1877. And I wrote, we arrived in the year 1400, before the Atlantic slave trade. We were well below ground, and it felt like we were actually in the bowels of a large, dark slave ship. As we walked around, it occurred to me that this feeling was intentional. That's how the building was planned. Before long, we realized that we actually were inside the hull of a slave ship, where I felt for a moment what it must have been like to be packed like human sardines with total strangers having no idea where I would be going and having absolutely no agency over my life. We then arrived at 1619 when the first slaves arrived at Jamestown, Virginia. We walked through plantations in the South where black people were completely at the mercy of their white owners. We learned that the average lifespan of enslaved Africans who worked on colonial sugar and rice plantations in the New World was seven years. Imagine. We walked past places in the north as we were reminded, were reminded that all 13 of the original colonies engaged in slavery. We continued walking until we arrived at the other side of the Civil War as we experienced what it was like to literally be owned by other people who frankly didn't like you very much and didn't trust you at all. And realizing that that's all you've ever known in life. And that's all your parents knew and your grandparents all the way back for some 250 years, a quarter of a millennium. Well, I was emotionally exhausted by the time we got through this first section of the history galleries. However, we had two more sections to go, so on we went up to the next level. This one is called Defending Freedom and Defining Freedom, 1876 through 1968. Here we learn that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't actually free black people, but rather led them into a new kind of slavery. We saw what the Jim Crow era was like, how black people in the North as well as in the South were never treated as equals and never offered the kind of freedom that white people took for granted. We saw in the South how prevalent lynching was after the Civil War, how a black man could be killed simply for looking at a white woman, and how the white men who killed them usually suffered no consequences whatsoever. We saw in the North how black people who lived in the cities were simply not allowed to live in the same neighborhoods as white people, how they were systematically denied loans for housing, how they paid more for rent in slums than their white counterparts, how their, um, sorry about that, their, then their white counterparts paid for larger homes in nicer neighborhoods with better schools and all kinds of infrastructure that was simply not available to the black families. And we saw how blacks risked their lives during the Civil, War, or the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s and how many of them actually did die. And many were beaten, attacked by dogs, jailed, simply for asking for the same rights and privileges as white people. Well, I'll tell you, I was even more emotionally exhausted by the time we got through that section of the history galleries. 
But we had one more section to go, so up we went to the next level, which was called A Changing America, 1968 and Beyond. Here we learned that major laws were passed by the end of the 60s in order to make life better and more fair for black people. We also learned that other laws were passed in order to put more people of color in prisons. We learned that many local governments created policies to keep black people from voting and still do. We learned that in many police departments throughout the country, officers used excessive force and sometimes even killed innocent black citizens and suffered no consequences for doing so. And we learned that much of the wealth in this country that has passed on from one generation to the next has passed over many black people because of policies that were made in order to do just that. I could go on, but suffice it to say that I was reaching nearly complete exhaustion by the time we got through the history galleries in the basement of the museum. The four floors above ground would have to wait for another time. And so would the Holocaust Museum and Native American Museum and other things that I wanted to do. As I looked at my friend David, I could see in his face the same feelings that I was feeling, emotional exhaustion. And it occurred to me that you can only take so much in at one point. And I do hope to get back to DC soon to see the rest of the museum and some of the other museums as well. But as I reflected back over this time, it occurred to me that we have made great strides in our country in terms of racism and racial discrimination, but we have a long ways to go. I also know that this doesn't just apply to people who are of African descent. In this past year, I have friends who are Asian in the San Francisco Bay Area who were concerned for their lives and for the lives of their grandmothers because some Asian women have been beaten simply for walking down a street when somebody didn't like them walking down that street. So I know that racism is still with us. We do have a long ways to go. And even though slavery as an institution is now outlawed, there are still forms of it that are part of our society. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul tells the followers of Jesus in Galatia, which is part of modern day Turkey, by the way, there is no longer slave or free. So this is Galatians, chapter 3. It's part of verse 28. The whole verse says there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Apostle Paul is sharing with the followers of Jesus in Galatia, that we all have value. Every single life has value. We are all one when it comes to that. So in Galatians itself, and those of you who've been here and heard me give messages many times before know how important it is that we not just look at little bits and pieces of the Bible and try to figure out what that means for us and for the people around us, but to look at the context. Look at the entire book, for example, and in this case, the entire letter from Paul to the Galatians. And this letter is all about freedom. It's all about the fact that we are free in Jesus Christ. 
God makes us all free. And Jesus came to let us know that we have freedom. Now, Galatians, the Galatians, the followers of Jesus in Galatia, were going through some troubling times. At least Paul was looking at what he was hearing from them and about them saying, this church has a big problem. And their problem, according to Paul, is they were not free. And the reason they weren't free is because people were showing up in the church, telling them that they had to do certain things in terms of religious rituals, rules, cultural practices. Bottom line, Paul was looking at this church that was primarily Gentile or Greek, and when you read either word in the New Testament, they basically pretty much always mean the same thing, the non-Jews. So here's a church that's made up of non-Jewish people, and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles or to the Greeks, and so he was out there promoting the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And all of a sudden, there were people showing up saying, ah, yes, Jesus, gotcha. But if you really want to follow Jesus, then you have to, not an option, you have to follow the Jewish rituals like the rest of us good Christians do. And Paul said that is a form of slavery. There's no freedom in that, and frankly, that's wrong. Those of us who follow Jesus know that we cannot impose our religious rituals and beliefs on people of different faiths. And frankly, that's a really good thing for us to remember today as we listen to the news and different politicians and policies where we know that there are always people that feel like their brand of religion, whether it's Christianity or not, is the way that we need to structure our country and force other people to abide by. So Paul is basically saying to the Galatians, you guys, if you're going to follow those people that tell you that, then you are not free. You are becoming slaves all over again. And basically what he's saying about slavery is those people who insist that everybody else has to follow their understanding of religious guidelines, uh, their understanding of religious rituals and policies, that is enslavement. And so Paul's saying, if you're gonna go there, you're becoming enslaved all over again, and what's the point? Paul calls these people who were promoting that kind of slavery false Christians. If you read this in the Greek, it's actually pseudo-brothers and sisters, pseudo-siblings. He's saying, you're not real brothers, you're not real siblings to each other. If you're insisting that somebody who comes from a different faith background as you has to do the same rituals as you simply because that's your background. Paul was completely against that. So one of the things I did over the last few days was I went through all of Galatians and I highlighted some of the key verses throughout Galatians. And I know I'll probably remember some of them, but I think it's really important that we notice what these verses are that are the key verses in Galatians. Of course, I already mentioned there is no longer slave or free. Another key verse is Paul tells them or he actually scolds the Galatians because they turned aside from the gospel. And that is actually a key verse. But what does it mean? First and foremost, what does gospel mean? When we read the word gospel today in the 21st century, we often think of the four gospels, right? You know, beginning with Jesus' birth, or actually John the Baptist, and before that, all the way through, you know, we go through Jesus' life, all of his teachings, 
the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We, we think of that as Gospels. But the Gospel of Mark, as far as we know, was the earliest of all those Gospels, and that was probably written at least 15 years after Paul wrote to the Galatians. So Paul was not talking about the Gospels as we understand them today. When Paul says, I'm scolding you basically for turning aside from the gospel. He meant simply the good news of Jesus as it was revealed to him. And to Paul, gospel meant freedom. From all the things that held people back, from fully experiencing life and sharing life in love with others. Gospel meant freedom by, freedom from, and freedom to. Paul gets into all of those. First of all, freedom is by God's grace. We are set free simply because God gives us freedom. There's nothing that we have to do or ever should do to be free people. That's just a given. Paul's just saying we are freed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ for those of us who believe in Jesus. Freedom from, Paul is really clear in Galatians, you are free from all the rules that people try to impose on you from their religion, from their denomination, from their culture, from their background. And let me just tell you really quickly, Paul was not against the Jewish religion. Sometimes people use this to become anti-Semitic. Paul was a faithful Jew. He followed Jesus, whom he called his Lord, who he knew and respected as a faithful Jew. Paul was simply saying, I don't have the right to Im impose my religious rituals on you. Freedom from that. And then freedom to, according to Paul, freedom to live by faith in God's loving presence, both that's inside of each of us and available in every relationship and every community that we're a part of. Paul is excited about freedom. And to Paul, gospel, good news, meant that freedom. So here's a couple other verses that are so important to understanding what Paul's talking about. I think actually the key verse, the key sentence in all of Galatians is when Paul says, Christ has set us free. If you're going to follow Christ, you have to understand we're all free. None of us in the church or outside the church has the right to impose our religious rituals, our beliefs, our policies, our structures on anybody else. You're all welcome to participate in them, but you're also welcome to participate in worshiping God any way that you choose to. And Paul says, you were called to freedom. This is actually a calling. Paul is like, he's not messing around here. You are called to be free and to promote freedom. And then Paul goes on to say, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. That's what it's all about. And finally, the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And any rule or practice that keeps you from that is simply not Christian. You're not following Jesus. So, what do we do with all this? I think, as I, as I consider Paul, I think, man, he was so against slavery of any kind. I can only imagine what he would have thought of institutional slavery, where a whole race of people was not only spiritually, but also physically enslaved for a quarter of a millennium. Paul was opposed to all kinds of slavery, and he jokingly, I think, says at the very end, let me read you this one verse that I, I wrote down just this morning. Through love, 
become slaves to one another. After just bashing slavery, he then kind of jokingly says, be slaves to one another. And I say jokingly because Paul is so clear in Galatians that slavery is not an option. It's nothing that anybody chooses or should choose. It's something that's done to you. And love is just the opposite. Love is always a choice that we make. But Paul is also looking at the fact that we do choose forms of slavery, don't we? We choose slavery in our own lives. We choose slavery in our relationships, sometimes in our families. Sometimes churches choose slavery by imposing certain things on people that that's not how they understand God. And so the takeaway for me is all forms of slavery are wrong, including institutional slavery, including anything that you choose to do that makes it more difficult for you or anybody else to love others. And according to Paul, as he wrote to the Galatians, our gift from God is our freedom. And we can choose to love, not only ourselves, but anybody else who might be suffering from the chains, the bonds of any kind of slavery. So as this message comes to a close, I want you to ask yourself, as I did at the beginning of the service, where do you see slavery in your life? And where do you see slavery in the institutions that either you're a part of or that you know that are a part of our island or our state or our nation? And what might you choose to do in love to end all of that slavery? Amen. And now it's time for the sharing of joys and concerns. Thank you, Joanne. And I will just call your attention to the top of page seven or actually all of page seven, where we have the things and the people on here that we have been praying for. And I've added, uh, before I get to the cards, I just wanted to um, share um, in terms of joys uh, for all the fathers and grandfathers and father figures that you are and that have been in our lives. Um, I also want to give thanks for our church, uh, not just Koloa Union Church, but for the wider church. Many of you know that um, this entire week has been what we call here in Hawaii, Aha Pai Aina, which is the annual gathering of the United Church of Christ in Hawaii. So all 118 churches were invited and most have participated in one form or another during this past week. And a couple highlights for me, one was last Sunday afternoon uh, David Vasquez Levy, the president of Pacific School of Religion, gave the message and encouraged us all as followers of Jesus here, and also promoted um, Christian education and theological education, which is a really important part of what it means to be Christian, is to constantly be learning about our faith. And I was just so proud of people in our church and people throughout the churches on Kauai and all of Hawaii who've taken part in classes that Pacific School of Religion has offered, and especially Tiffany Marotti, who actually received her certificate in uh, theological education for leadership. Just, uh, we celebrated that just this last month. So congratulations, Tiffany, we gave thanks for you. I think that was last Sunday and a couple other times during the week as well. There was a time where we just actually all focused on theological education for leadership and honored all those who received their certificates, took one or more classes, and all of those who volunteered to make this possible throughout Hawaii. 
Another takeaway for me that was a highlight of this week, and basically it started yesterday, or a week ago, Sunday, and ended yesterday afternoon, but um, a highlight for me was the, um, a new missional team in the Hawaii conference. And uh, this missional team is all about engagement and initiatives. Um, I'm trying to think of the actual wording. I don't think I got that right. But um, the, the, the name doesn't matter so much. The, the important thing is that this missional team is focusing on what it means to be the church in the 21st century in Hawaii and how we can all be a part of that and learn together what it means to be the church today. And uh, being a missional team, there will be representatives from each of the islands, all of the associations and leadership that are focusing together on how we can be the church today here in Hawaii, what that means for this year and for the years to come. So anyway, that's a brand new missional team, um, which was voted in just yesterday. And you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. And many of you have met the Reverend Valerie Ross, who is our new associate conference minister. She's been here to visit a couple times to some of the things we've had. And she marched with us in the Pride Parade when we did that a couple of weeks ago. And she is actually the lead staff person for that. So I know that she'll be sharing more of that with us as well. So anyway, I give thanks for Ahapai Aina, and we'll also just want to pray for racial justice and an end to discrimination. And then from Grace Eleanor, my daughter, grandson, and I are going to Maui next weekend for family birthdays. Grace Eleanor's 94th is June 30th, 94 years old. Congratulations and happy birthday. <laughs> Wonderful. And then from Tiffany, mahalo to Nolan Strong and his soccer team for a wonderful car wash yesterday. The entire ohana contributed as Nolan will be traveling to play soccer. Prayers for Eric Honma for recovery after his six hour long surgery this week. And Judith has a joy, a new great grandbaby in San Diego and asks for prayers for Chanel and Ryland. And then prayers for Debbie Gunning for a speedy recovery. She's been sick, looks like uh, this for a week, I think it says, but I think she just got back from her trip and is just not feeling great. So we'll keep Debbie in our prayers. And I would give all of us just a moment of silence as we give thanks for the many, many blessings in our lives and also that we can all lift up the prayers that I've mentioned, the prayers on page seven in our bulletin, and any prayers that you are carrying with you at the moment. And after a moment of silence, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray together. Holy God, when we think of all that Jesus did to make us free, I ask that freedom would reign in our hearts, in all of our relationships and families, in our communities, in our country and in our world. And oh God, we ask that you would give us courage to open our eyes to all the things that we have left undone, unsaid, unheard. And God, give us the courage and the wisdom to accept the things that have happened in the past and to do our best to understand them so that we can keep injustice and discrimination from happening in the future. 
Oh God, we give you thanks for our many blessings, for all of the fathers and grandfathers, great-grandfathers, father figures that are in our lives, those of us who are those things as well. God, we thank you on this day for all the examples that have been set for us and all the encouragement and support that we have received. God, we thank you also for our church, for this place here in Koloa, and also the wider church. We give you thanks for your Spirit's movement among us, for encouraging us to see new things and to take risks and try new things. And God, as we continue in the early part of the 21st century to figure out what it is that you are calling us to be as the church, May we all be committed to having open hearts and open minds as well. God, we thank you in particular for a new grandbaby, for birthdays, for the children of our church, as well as for the kupuna and everybody in between. We thank you for our kids in our Sunday school and for those who participate in sports programs. And God, we also pray for those who are ill those who are a part of our congregation and for family. We pray for healing and for recovery. We pray for comfort and for peace. Oh God, as we continue to pray for peace, we remember Ukraine. We remember victims of gun violence in our schools, in churches, in health facilities, in so many other places, even people sitting on their front porch and enjoying a picnic in their yard. God, we pray for peace in people's hearts and in their lives. And we also continue to pray for health and safety during this time of pandemic. Oh God, may it come to an end. Even though we know life will never be normal in the sense that we once defined normal, may we discover our new normality with loving hearts and open minds. And God, as this service comes to a close, we pray for all those who suffer, all those who are lonely, all those who grieve. May they see how you show up in love and comfort in all of our lives. Amen. Okay, this, this next song is called Ohai Ali. I think uh, from uh, Mr. Kuana Torres Kahele. And if you don't know the Ohai trees, found a lot of times in the cooler areas on the mountaintops. Um, has this wonderful blossom. And uh, we, we know that the trees now are, are under attack by, a, uh, I think it's a fungus, and we're having rapid death of these Ohai trees. But this song called Ohai Ali is about the blossoms, Ali King. And so is this uh, blossom of the king. And in this case, you know, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. And um, when you see Rose Dance, it's talking about Vili entwining these delicate flowers of such beauty into a lei to adorn the king. It says, my affection is woven into adornment of adoration. Lei of love, garland of the kings, as lei aloha, lei kula ana li'i. And I always mention that when they write a song like this, the flower is actually talking about each one of you as this special blossom, this special flower that's created to adorn the king in this beautiful day. And that each of you are especially special in, in his eyes. So is Ohai Ali.
It's now time to put our face masks back on, and I would just remind you to keep your face mask on, fully covering your nose and mouth until you're either back in your vehicle or off the church property. And now, would you please stand for the benediction? Go from this place and be free. Go from this place and love, and go from this place sharing the freedom and the love with everyone. May the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people, now and forever. Amen. And go in peace. <laughs>